a chill books original. The Conference of the Birds by Farid Ud Din Adar. Translated by Edward Fitzgerald. Was on a time from all the circles seven, between the steadfast earth and rolling heaven, the birds of all note, plumage and degree, that float in air and roost upon the tree, and they that from the waters snatch their meat, and they that scour the desert with long feet, birds of all natures, known or not to man, flocked from all quarters into full devain, on no less solemn business than to find or choose a sultan caliph of their kind, for whom, if never theirs or lost, they'd pined. The snake had his, twas said, and so the beast, his lion lord, and man had his at least, and that the birds who nearest were the skies, and when a peril led in its angel dies, should be without, under no better law, than that which lost all other in the maw, dispersed without a bond of union, nay, or meeting to make each the other's prey. This was the grievance, this the solemn thing, on which the scattered commonwealth of wing, from all the four winds, flying like to cloud, that met and black in heaven, and thunder loud, with sound of whirring wings and beaks that clashed, down like a torrent on the desert dashed, till by degrees the hubbub and pell-mell, into some order and precedence fell, and proclamation made of silence, each, in special accent, but in general speech, that all should understand, as seemed the best, the congregation of all wings addressed, and first, with heart so full as from his eyes ran weeping, uprose Tajira the wise, the mystic mark upon whose bosom showed, that he alone of all the birds thee rode, had traveled, and the crown upon his head, had reached the goal, and he stood forth and said, O birds, by what authority divine! I speak you know by his authentic sign, and name, and blazoned on my breast and bill. And now you want a caliph, and I know him, and his whereabout, and how to go. And go alone I could, and plead your cause, alone for all, but by the eternal laws, yourselves by toil and travel of your own must for your old delinquency atone. Were you indeed not blinded by the curse of self-exile that still grows worse and worse, yourselves would know that, though you see him not, he is with you this moment, on this spot. Your Lord, through all forgetfulness and crime, here, there, and everywhere, and through all time. But as a father, whom some wayward child, by sinful self will has unreconciled, waits till the sullen reprobated cost of long repentance should regain the lost. Therefore, yourselves to see as you are seen. Yourselves must bridge the gulf you made between, by such a search and travel to be gone, up to the mighty mountain calf, whereon hinges the world, and round about whose knees, into one ocean mingle the seven seas, in whose impenetrable forest folds of light and dark simmer his presence holds, not to be reached, it to be reached at all, but by a road the stoutest might appall of travel not of days or months, but years, lifelong perhaps, of dangers, doubts, and fears, as yet unheard of, sweat of blood and brain, interminable, often all in vain, and it successful, no return again, a road whose very preparation scared, the traveler who yet must be prepared, who then this travel to result would bring, needs both a lion's heart beneath the wing, and even more, a spirit purified, of worldly passion, malice, lust, and pride, Yet, even of worldly wisdom, which grows dim and dark, the nearer it approaches him, who to the Spirit's eye alone revealed, by sacrifice of wisdom's self unsealed, without which none who reached the place could bear, to look upon the glory dwelling there. One night from out the swarming city gate, stepped holy badges it to meditate, alone amid the breathing fields that lay, in solitary silence leagues away, beneath the moon and stars as bright as day, and the saint wondering such a temple were, and so lit up, and scarce one worshipper. A voice from heaven amid the stillness said, The royal road is not for all to tread, nor is the royal palace for the rout, who, even if they reach it, are shut out. The blaze that from my harem window breaks, with fright the rabble of the roadside takes, and even of those that at my portal din, thousands may knock for one that enters in. Thus spoke the Tajidar, and the winged crowd, that underneath his word in silence bowed. Clapped acclamation and their hearts and eyes were kindled by the firebrand of the wise. They felt their degradation, they believed. The word that told them how to be retrieved, and in that glorious consummation one, forgot the cost at which it must be done. They only longed to follow, they would go, whither he led, through flood or fire or snow. So cried the multitude, but some there were, 
who listened with a cold disdainful air, content with what they were or grudging cost. Of time or travel that might all be lost. These, one by one, came forward and preferred. Unwise objection, which the wiser word. Shot with direct reproof or subly round. With argument and allegory wound. The pheasant first would know by what pretence, the tajadar to that preeminence was raised, a bird, but for his lofty crest. And such the pheasant had, like all the rest. Who answered, by no virtue of my own. Suleiman chose me, but by his alone. Not by the gold and silver of my size, made mine, but the free largest of his eyes. Behold the grace of Allah comes and goes, as to itself is good, and no one knows. Which way it turns, in that mysterious court, that he most finds who furthest travels forward. For one they crawl upon his knees lifelong, and yet may never reach or all go wrong. Another just arriving at the place he toiled for, and the door shut in his face. Whereas another, scarcely gone astride, and suddenly, behold he is inside. But though the runner win not, yet it stands, no thorn will turn to roses in his hands. Each one must do his best and all endure, and all endeavor, hoping but not sure. Heaven its own umpire is, its bidding do, and thou perchance shalt be Suleiman's too. One day Shah Mahmud, riding with the wind, a-hunting, left his retinue behind, and coming to a river, whose swift course, doubled back game and dog and man and horse, beheld upon the shore a little lad, a fishing very poor and tatter clad. He was, and weeping as his heart would break. So the great sultan, for good humor's sake, pulled in his horse a moment, and drew nigh, and after making his salon, asked why. He wept, weeping, the sultan said, so sore, as he had never seen one weep before. The boy looked up, and o Amir, he said, seven of us are at home, and father dead, and mother left with scarce a bit of bread. And now, since sunrise have I fished, and see. Caught nothing for our supper, woe is me. The sultan lighted from his horse, behold, said he, good fortune will not be controlled. And since today yours seems to turn from you, suppose we try for once what mine will do, and we will share alike in all I win. So the shah took and flung his fortune in the net, which, cast by the great mamun's hand, a hundred glittering fishes brought to land. The lad looked up in wonder, mamun smiled, and vaulted into saddle, but the child ran after. Nay, Amur, but half the hall. Is yours by bargain? Nay, tay take all? The sultan cried, and shook his bridle free. But mind, tomorrow all belongs to me. And so rode off. Next morning, Devan, the sultan's mind upon his bargain ran, and being somewhat in a mind for sport, sent for the lad, who, carried up to court, and marching into royalty's full blaze, with such a catch of fish as yesterday's. The sultan called and set him by his side, and asking him, what luck? The boy replied, this is the luck that follows every cast. Since over my net the sultan's shadow passed, then came the nightingale from such a draught, of ecstasy that from the rose he quaffed, reeling as drunk and ever did distill, in exquisite divisions from his bill, to inflame the hearts of men, and thus sang he. To me alone alone is given the key of love, of whose whole mystery possessed. When I reveal a little to the rest, forth with creation listening for sakes. The reins of reason and my friends he takes. Yea, whosoever once has quaint this wine, he leaves unlistened David's song for mine. In vain do men for my divisions strive, and die themselves making dead lutes alive. I hang the stars with meshes for men's souls, the garden underneath my music rolls, the long, long morns that mourn the rose away. I sit in silence and on anguish pray, but the first air which the new year shall breathe, up to my boughs a message from beneath, that in her green hair my bride unveils. My throat bursts silence in her advent hails, who in her crimson volume registers, the notes of him whose life is lost in hers. The rose I love and worship now is here, if dying, yet reviving, year by year. But that you tell of all my life why waste, in vainly searching, or, if found, not taste. So with division infinite and trill, on would the nightingale have warbled still, and all the world have listened but a note of sterner import check the lovesick throat. O watering with thy melodious tears, love's garden, and who dost indeed the ears of men with thy melodious fingers mold, as David's finger iron did of old, why not, like David, dedicate thy dower of song to something better than a flower, empress indeed of beauty, so they say, but one whose empire hardly lasts a day, 
by insurrection of the morning's breath that made her hurry to decay in death. And while she last contented to be seen and worshipped for the garden's only queen, leaving thee singing on thy bow forlorn, or if she smile on thee, perhaps in scorn. Like that fond dervish waiting the throng, when some world-famous beauty went along, who smiling on the antic as she passed, forth with staff, bead, and scrip away he cast, and groveling in the kennel, took to wine, before her door among the dogs and swine, which when she often went unheeding by, but one day, quite as heedless, asked him, why? He told her that one smile, which all the rest passing, had kindled hope within his breast. Again she smiled and said, O oh, self-beguiled, poor wretch, at whom and not on whom I smiled. Then came the subtle parrot in a coat, greener than greensward, and about his throat. A collar ran of sub-sulfurious gold, and in his beak a sugar plum he trolled, that all his words with luscious lisping ran, and to this tune, O oh, cruel cage and man, more iron still who did confine me there, who else with him whose livery I wear, ere this to his eternal found had been, and drunk what should have kept me ever green. But now I know the place, and I am free. To go, and all the wise will follow me. Some, and upon the nightingale one eye. He leered, for nothing with a blossom sigh. But I am for the luscious pulp that grows. Where, and for which the blossom only blows, and which so long as the green tree provides. What better grows along calf's dreary sides? And what more needful profit there than he, who gives me life to nip it from the tree? To whom the tangent are, O thou who's best. In the green leaf of paradise is dressed, But whose neck candles with a lower fire? O slip the collar off of base desire, And stand a parallel in heaven's woof entire. This life that hangs so sweet about your lips, But, spite of all your kisser, slips and slips. What is it but itself the coarser rind Of the true life with inside and behind? Which he shall never never reach unto, Till the gross shell of carcase he break through. For what said he, that dying hermit, whom? Your prophet came to, trailing through the gloom, his emerald vest, and tempted, come with me, and live. The hermit answered, not with thee. Two worlds there are, and this was thy design, and thou hast got it, but the next is mine. Whose fount is this life's death, and to whose side, even now I find my way without a guide. Then like a sultan glittering in all rays of jewelry, and decked with his own blaze, the glorious peacock swept into the ring, and, turning slowly that the glorious thing, might fill all eyes with wonder, thus said he. Behold, the secret artist making me, with no one color of the skies bedecked, but from its angel's feathers did select, to make up mine withal, the Gabriel of all the birds, though from my place I fell, in Eden, when acquaintance I did make, in those blessed days with that seven-headed snake, and that's with him my perfect beauty marred, with these ill feet was thrust out into barred. Little I care for worldly fruit or flower, would you restore me to lost Eden's bower, but first my beauty making all complete, with reparation of these ugly feet? Were it, was answered, only to return, to that lost Eden, better far to burn. In self-abasement, up thy plumed pride, and even with lamer feet to creep inside. But all mistaken you, and all like you, that long for that lost Eden as the true, there as it was, still nothing but the shade, and out court of the majesty that made, that which I point you towered, and which the king, I tell you of broods over with his wing, with no deciduous leaf, but with the rose of spiritual beauty, smells and glows. No plot of earthly pleasance, but the whole true garden of the universal soul. For so creation's master jewel fell, from that same Eden, loving which too well, the work before the artist did prefer, and in the garden lost the gardener. Wherefore one day about the garden went, a voice that found him in his false content, and like a bitter sarcer of the north, shriveled the garden up, and drove him forth, in the wilderness, and so the eye of Eden closed on him till by and by. Then from a ruin, where concealed he lay, watching his buried gold and hating day, who did the owl, I tell you, my delight, is in a ruin and the dead of night, where I was born, and where I loved to won, all my life long, sitting on some cold stone, away from all your roistering companies, in some dark corner where a treasure lies. That buried by some miser in the dark, speaks up to me at midnight like a spark, and over it like a talisman I brood, companion of the serpent and the toad. What need of other sovereign having found, and keeping as in prison underground, one before whom all other kings bow down? 
and with his glittering heel their foreheads crown. He that a miser lives and miser dies, at the last day what figure shall he rise? A fellow all his life lived hoarding gold, and, dying, hoarded left it. And behold, one night his son saw peering through the house, a man with yet the semblance of a mouse, watching a crevice in the wall, and cried, My father? Lias the Musoman replied, Thy father? But why watching thus? For fear, lest any smell my treasure buried here. But wherefore, sir, so metamosified? Because, my son, such is the true outside of the inner soul by which I lived and died. A, said the partridge, with his foot and bill. Crimson with raking rubies from the hill, and clattering his spurs. Where with the ground I stab, said he for rubies, that, when found, I swallow. Which as soon as swallow up turn, to sparks which though my beak and eyes do burn. Gold, as you say, is but dull metal dead, and hanging on the hoarder's soul like lead. But rubies that have blood within, and grown, and nourished in the mountain heart of stone, burn with an inward light, which they inspire and make their owners lords of their desire. To whom the Tajidar, as idly sold to the quick pebble as the drowsy gold, as dead when sleeping in her mountain mine, as dangerous to him who makes them shine. Slavish indeed to do their lord's commands, and slave-like aptest to escape his hands, and serve a second master like the first, and working all their wonders for the worst. Never was jewel after or before, like that Suleiman for a signet war, whereby one ruby winning scarce a grain, did sea and land and all therein constrain. Yea, even the winds of heaven made the fierce east, bear his league-wide pavilion like a beast, whether he would. Yea, the bit angel held his subject, and the lower fiend compelled. Till, looking round about him in his pride, he overtaxed the fountain that supplied, praying that after him no son of clay should ever touch his glory. And one day, Almighty God his jewel stole away, and gave it to the div, who with the ring, wore also the resemblance of the king, and so for forty days played such a game, as blots Suleiman's forty years with shame. Then the Shah Falcon, tossing up his head, blink hooded as it was, behold, he said, I am the chosen comrade of the king, and perch upon the fist that wears the ring, born, bred, and nourished in the royal court. I take the royal name and make this sport, and if strict discipline I undergo, and half my life am blinded be it so, because the Shah's companion Ilnaybrook, on aught save royal company to look. And why am Edo leave my king and fair, with all these rabble wings and are not wear? O oh, blind indeed, the answer was, and dark, to any but a vulgar mortal mark, and drunk with pride of vassalage to those, whose humor like their kingdom comes and goes, all mutability, who one day please to give, and next day what they gave not seize, like to the fire a dangerous friend at best, which who keeps farthest from does wiseliest. A certain shah there was in days foregone, who had a lovely slate he doted on, and cherished as the apple of his eye, clad gloriously, fed sumptuously, said high, and never was at ease were he not by, who yet, for all this sunshine, day by day was seen to wither like a flower away, which, when observing, one without the veil, a favor asked the favorite, why so pale and sad, thus, sadly answered the poor thing. No sun that rises sets until the king, whose archery is famous among men, aims at an apple on my head, and when, the stricken apple splits, and those who stand, around cry low, the shah's unerring hand. Then he too laughing asked me why so pale, and sorrowsome, as could the sultan fail, who such a master of the bow confessed, and aiming by that head that he loves best. Then on a sudden swoop the phoenix down, as though he wore as well as gave the crown, and cried, I care not, I'd await on kings, whose crowns are the shadow of my wings. A was the answer, and, pray, how it sped, on which it lighted, many a mortal head. A certain sultan dying his vizier, in dream beheld him, and in mortal fear, began, O mighty Shah of Shahs, thrice blessed, but loud the vision shrieked and struck its breast, and stabbed me not with empty title, cried, one only Shah there is, and I'm beside, who from his throne above for certain ends, a while some spangle of his glory lends to men on earth, but calling in again, exacts a strict account of every grain. Sultan I lived and held the world in scorn. O better had I gleaned the field of corn. O better had I been a beggar born, and for my throne and crown, down in the dust. My living head had laid where dead I must. O withered, 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 be the wing whose overcasting shadow made me king. 
then from a pond, where all day long he count. Waddle the dapper duck demure, adept, at infinite ablution and precise, in keeping of his raiment clean and nice, and sure of all the race of birds, said he, none for religious purity like me, beyond what strictest rituals prescribe. Methinks I am the saint of all our tribe, to whom by miracle the water that I wash in also makes my praying mat, to whom more angrily than all replied, the leader lashing that religious pride, that under ritual obedience to outer law with inner might dispense, for there is all the feather to be seen, could one see through, the maw was not so clean, but he that made both maw and feather too, would take account of, seeing through and through. A shah returning to his capital, his subjects dressed it forth in festival, thronging with acclamation square and street, and kneeling flung before his horse's feet, jewel and gold, all which with scarce an eye, the sultan superciliously rode by, till coming to the public prison, they who dwelt within those grisly walls, by way, a welcome, having neither pearl nor gold, over the wall, chopped head and carcase rolled, some almost parked to money with the sun, some white with execution that day done. At which grim compliment at last the shah, drew bridle, and amid a wild hurrah, of savage recognition, smiling through, silver and gold among the wretched crew, and so rode forward, worried of his train, one wondering that while others sued in vain, with costly gifts which carelessly he passed, but smiled at ghastly welcome like the last. The Shah made answer, all that pearl and gold, of ostentatious welcome only told, a little with great clamor from the store, of hypocrites who kept at home much more. But when those severed heads and trunks I saw, save by strict execution of my law, they had not parted company, not one, but told my will not talked about, but done. Then from a wood was heard unseen to coo, the ring dove, Yusuf, 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 you. For thus her sorrow broke her note in twain, and just were broken, took it up again. Suf, Yusuf, Yusuf, Yusuf. But one note, which, still repeating, she made hoarse her throat, till checked, O oh, you, who with your idle sighs, block up the road of better enterprise. Sham sorrow all or bad is sham if true. When once the better thing is come to do, beware lest wailing thus you meet his doom. Who all too long his darling wept, from whom, you draw the very name you hold so dear, and which the world is somewhat tired to hear. When Yusuf from his father's home was torn, the patriarch's heart was utterly forlorn, and like a pipe with but one stop his tongue, with nothing but the name of Yusuf wrung. Then down from heaven's branches flew the bird of heaven and said, God wearies of that word. Haste thou not else to do and else to say. So Jacob's lips were sealed from that day, but one night in a vision far away, his darling in some alien field he saw, binding the sheaf, and what between the awe, of God's displeasure and the bitter pass, of passionate affection, sighed a loss, and stopped, but with the morning sword of flame, that oped his eyes the sterner angels came, for the forbidden word not uttered by thy lips was yet sequestered him at sigh, and away passion whose excess was wrong, blinded the aged eyes that wept too long, and after these came others, arguing, inquiring and excusing, some one thing, and some another, endless to repeat, but in the main, sloth, folly, or deceit. Their souls were to the vulgar figure cast of earthly victual, not of heavenly fast. At last one smaller bird of a rare kind, of modest plume and unpresumptuous mind, whispered, O Tajadar, we know indeed, how thou both knowest, and wouldest help our need. For thou art wise and holy, and hast been, behind the veil, and there the presence seen. But we are weak and vain with little care. Beyond our yearly nests and daily fare, how should we reach the mountain? And if there, how could so great a prince to hear our prayer? For there, you say, dwells the Simurg alone, in glory like Suleiman on his throne, and we but Pismar is at his feet. Can he? Such puny creatures stoop to hear or see, or hearing, seeing on us, unakin, as he to folly, woe, and death, and sin to whom the Tajadar, whose voice for those, bewildered ones to full compassion rose. O lost so long in exile, you disclaim. The very found of being whence you came cannot be parted from and will or no, whether for good or evil must reflow. For look, the shadows into which the light of his pure essence down by infinite, predation dwindles, which at random play, through space in shape indefinite, one ray of his creative will into defined. 
Creation quickens, with its swim the wind, and they the flood below, and man and beast, that walk between from lion to the least pismire that creeps along Suleiman's wall, yet that in which they swim, fly, walk, and crawl. However near the fountain light, or far, removed, yet his authentic shadows are, dead matter's self but the dark residue, exterminating glory dwindles to, a mystery too fearful in the crowd, to utter, scarcely to thyself aloud, but when in solitary watch and prayer, considered and religiously beware, lest thou the copy with the type confound, and deity with deity in drowned, for as pure water into pure wine, incorporating shall itself reline, while the dull drug lies half resolved below. With him and with his shadows is it so, the baser forms, to whatsoever change, subject still vary through their lower range, to which the higher even shall decay, that, letting ooze their better part away, for things of sense and matter in the end, shall merge into the clay to which they tend. Unlike to him, who straining through the bond, of outward being for a life beyond, while the gross worldling to his center clings, that draws him deeper in exalting springs, to merge him in the central soul of things. And shall not he pass home with other zest, who, with full knowledge, yearns for such a rest, than he, who with his better self at strife, drags on the weary exile called this life, one, like a child with outstretched arms and face upturned, anticipates his sire's embrace, the other crouching like a guilty slave, till flogged to punishment across the grave. And knowing that his glory ill can bear, the unpurged eye, do thou thy breast prepare. And the mysterious mirror he set there, to temper his reflected image in, clear of distortion, doubleness, and sin. And in thy conscience understanding this, the double only seems, but the one is, thyself to self-annihilation give, that this false two and that true one may live. For this I say, if, looking in thy heart, thou for self will mistake thy shadow part, that shadow part indeed into the sun, shall melt but senseless of its union. But in that mirror, if with purged eyes, thy shadow thou for shadow recognize, then shalt thou back into thy center fall, a conscious rate of that eternal all. He ceased, and for a while amazement quelled, the host, and in the chain of silence held, a mystery so awful who would dare, so glorious who would not wish to share. So silence brooded on the feathered folk, till here and there a timid murmur broke, from some too poor in honest confidence, and then from others of too much pretense, whom both, as each unduly hoped or feared, the Tajadar in answer checked or cheered. Some said their hearts were good indeed to go. The way he pointed out, but they were slow. Of comprehension and scarce understood. Their present evil or the promised good. And so, though willing to do all they could, must not they fall short or go wholly wrong, on such mysterious errand and so long? Whom the wise leader bid but do their best, in hope and faith, and leave to him the rest. For he who fixed the race, and knew its length, and danger also knew the runner's strength. Shah Mahmud, absent on him enterprise, Ayaz, the very darling of his eyes, at home under an evil eye fell sick. Then cried the Sultan to a soldier quick, To horse, to horse, without a moment's stay, the shortest road with all the speed you may, or, by the Lord, your head shall pay for it. Off went the soldier, plying spur and bit, over the sandy desert, over green valley and mountain, and the stream between, without a moment stop for rest or bait, up to the city, to the palace gate, up to the presence chamber at a stride, and lo, the sultan at his darling's side, then thought the soldier, I have done my best, and yet shall die for it. The sultan guessed, his thought and smiled, indeed your best you did, the nearest road you knew, and well you rid, and if I knew a shorter my excess, of knowledge does but justify thy less. And then, with drooping crest and feather came, Others bowed down with penitence and shame. They longed indeed to go, but how begin? Meshed and entangled as they were in sin, which oftentimes repentance of past wrong, as often broken had but knit more strong. Whom the wise leader bid be of good cheer, and, conscious of the fault, dismiss the fear, nor at the very entrance of the fray. Their weapon, even if broken, fling away. Since mercy on the broken branch anew would blossom, were but each repentance true. For did not God his prophet take to task? Seven times of thee did Karun pardon ask, which, hadst thou been like me as maker, yeah, but present at the kneading of his clay, with those twain elements of hell and haven, one prayer had won what thou didn't ask to seven. 
for like a child sent with a fluttering light. To feel his way along a gusty night, man walks the world, again and yet again. The lamp shall be by fits of passion slain, but shall not he who sent him from the door. Relight the lamp once more, and yet once more. When the rebellious host from death shall wake, black with despair of judgment, God shall take. Ages of holy merit from the count of angels, to make up man's short amount, and bid the murmuring angel gladly spare. Of that which undiminishing his share, a bliss, shall rescue thousands from the cost, of bankruptcy within the prison lost. Another story told how in the scale, goodwill beyond mere knowledge would prevail. In paradise, the angel Gabriel heard, the lips of Allah trembling with the word, of perfect acceptation, and he thought, some perfect faith, such perfect answer wrought, but hose, and therewith slipping from the crypt, of Sidra, through the angel ranks he slipped, watching what lip yet trembled with the shot, that so it at the mark, but found it not. Then, in a glance to earth, he threaded through, mosque, palace, cell, and cottage of the true. Belief in vain, so back to heaven went, and Allah's lips still trembling with assent. Then the tenacious angel once again, threaded the ranks of heaven and earth, in vain, till, once again returned to paradise. There looking into God's, the angel's eyes, beheld the prayer that brought that benison, rising like incense from the lips of one, who to an idol bowed, as best he knew, under that false god worshipping the true. And then came others whom the summons found, not wholly sick indeed, but far from sound, whose light in constant soul alternate flew, from saint to sinner, and to both untrue, who, like a niggard tailor, tried to match truth's single garment with a worldly patch. A dangerous game, for, striving to adjust the hesitating scale of either lust, that which had least within it upward flew, and still the weightier to the earth down drew. And while suspended between rise and fall, apt with a shaking hand to forfeit all, there was a queen of Egypt, like the bride, of night full moon-faced and cannabis eyed whom one among the meanest of her crowd loved, and she knew it, for he loved aloud, and sent for him, and said, Thou lovest thy queen. Now therefore thou hast this to choose between, fly for thy life, or for this one night wed, thy queen, and with the sunrise lose thy head. He paused, he turned to fly, she struck him dead. For had he truly loved his queen, said she, he would have once have given his life for me, and life and wife had carried. But he lied, and loving only life, has justly died. And then came one who having cleared his throat, with sanctimonious sweetness in his note, thus lisped, Behold I languish from the first, with passionate and unrequited thirst, of love for more than any mortal bird. Therefore have I withdrawn me from the herd, to pine in solitude. But thou at last, haste drawn a line across the dreary past, and sure I am by foretaste that the wine I long for, and thou tellest of, shall be mine. But he was sternly checked, I tell thee this. Such boast is no assurance of such bliss. Thou canst not even fill the sail of prayer, unless from him breathe that authentic air, that shall lift up the curtain that divides, his lover from the harem where he hides. And the fulfillment of thy vows must be, not from thy love for him, but his for thee. The third night after Bajazid had died, one saw him in a dream at his bedside, and said, Thou Bajazid, tell me, O Par, how fared it there with Munkar and Nacre? And Bajazid replied, When from the grave, they met me rising, and if Allah's slave, ask me, or collared with the chain of hell. I said, Not nah, but God alone can tell. My passion for his service were but fond. Ambition had not he approved the bond. Had he not round my neck the collar thrown, and told me in the number of his own, and that he only knew, what signifies, a hundred years of prayer if none replies. But said another, then shall none the seal of acceptation on his forehead feel, ere the grave yield them on the other side, where all is settled. But the chief replied, Enough for us to know that who is meet shall enter, and with unreproved feet, even as he might upon the waters walk, the presence room and in the presence talk, with such unbridled license as shall seem, to the uninitiated to blaspheme. Just as another holy spirit fled, the skies above him burst into a bed, of angels looking down and singing clear. Nightingale, nightingale, thy rose is here, and yet the door wide open to that bliss, as some hot lover slides a scanty kiss. The saint cried, all eyes sighed for come to this. I who life long have struggled, Lord, to be, 
not of thy angels one, but one with thee. Others were sure that all he said was true. They were extremely wicked, but they knew. And much they longed to go at once, but some, they said, so unexpectedly had come. Leaving their nests half-built, in bad repair, with children in, themselves about to pair. Might he not choose a better season, day, better perhaps a year or two's delay, till all was settled, and themselves more stout, and strong to carry their repentance out, and then, and then, the same or like excuse, with heart and heart and resolution loose, with dowling, and old age itself engaged, still to shirk that which shirking we have aged. And so with self-delusion, till too late, death upon all repentance shuts the gate, or some fierce blow compels the way to choose, and forced repentance half its virtue lose. As of an aged Indian king they tell, who, when his empire with his army fell, under young Mahmud's sword of wrath was sent, at sunset to the conqueror in his tent. But ere the old king's silver head could reach the ground, was lifted up with kindly speech, and with so holy mercy reassured, that after due persuasion he adjured, his idols sate upon Mahmud's divan, and took the name and faith of Musulman. But when the night fell in his tent alone, the poor old king was heard to weep and groan, and smite his bosom, which when Mahmud knew, he went to him and said, Lo, if thou rue, thy lost dominion, thou shalt rear the ring of thrice as large a realm. But the dark king still wept, and ashes on his forehead threw, and cried, Not for my kingdom lost I rue, but thinking how at the last day will stand. The prophet with the volume in his hand, and ask of me how wast that in thy day of glory thou didst turn from me and slay my people, but stum is thy infidel. Before my true believer's army fell, like corn before the reaper, thou didst own, his sword who scoutedst me, of seed so sown. What profitable harvest should be grown? Then after cheering others who delayed, not of the road but of themselves afraid, the tangent are the troop of those addressed, whose uncomplying attitude confessed, their souls entangled in the old deceit, and hankering still after forbidden meat. O ye who so long feeding on the husk, forego the fruit, and doting on the dusk, of the false dawn, are blinded to the true. That in the maiden of this world pursue, the golden ball which, driven to the goal, wins the world's game, but loses your own soul, or like to children after bubbles run, that still elude your fingers, or, if one, burst in derision at your touch, all thin, glitter without, and empty wind within. So as a prosperous worldling on the bed of death, behold, I am as one, he said, who all my life long have been measuring wind, and, dying now leave even that behind. This world's a nest in which the cockatrice is warmed and hatched of vanity and vice, a false bazaar whose wares are all a lie, or never worth the price at which you buy. A many-headed monster that's supplied, the faster, faster is unsatisfied. So as one, Hearing a rich fool one day, to God for yet one other blessing pray, bid him no longer bounce his heaven tire. For life to feed, but death to quench the fire. And what are all the vanities and wiles, in which the false world decks herself and smiles, to draw men down into her harlot lap? Bless of the flesh that soul and body sap, and melting soul down into carnal lust, even that for which tis sacrifice disgust, or lust of worldly glory, hollow more than the drum beaten at the sultan's door, and fluctuating with the breath of man, as the vain banner flapping in the van, and lust of gold, perhaps of lusts the worst, the miscreated idol most accursed, that between man and him who made him stands, the felon that with suicidal hands, he sweats to dig and rescue from his grave, and sets at large to make himself its slave. For lo, to what worse than oblivion gone, are some the cozening world most toted on. Pharaoh tried glory, and his chariots drowned. Karun with all his gold went underground, down toppled Nembroth with his airy stare, shedded among his roses lived, but where? And as the world upon her victims feeds, so she herself goes down the way she leads. For all her false allurements are the threads, the spider from her entrails spins and spreads. For home and hunting ground, and by and by, darts a due signal on the tangled fly, seizes, diswings, and drains the life and leaves the swinging carcase and forthwith reweaves her web, each victim adding to the store of poisoned entrail to entangle more. And so she bloats in glory, till one day, the master of the house, passing that way, perceives, and with one flourish of his broom, of web and fly and spider clears the room. 
Behold, dropped through the gate of mortal birth, the knightly soul alights from heaven on earth, begins his race, but scarce the saddle feels. When a foul imp up from the distance steals, and, double as he will, about his heels, closer and ever closer circling creeps, then, half invited on the saddle leaps, clings round the rider, and, once there in vain, the strongest strives to thrust him off again. In childage just peeps at the blade of ill, that youth to lust rears, fury, and self-will. And as man cools to sensual desire, ambition catches with as fierce a fire, until old age sends him with one last lust, of gold, to keep it where he found, in dust. Life at both ends so feeble and constrained, how should that imp of sin be slain or chained? And woe to him who feeds the hateful beast, that at his feeder makes an after-feast. We know the wolf, by stratagem and force, can hunt the tiger down, but what resource? Against the plague we heedless hatch within, then growing, pamper into full-blown sin. With the soul's self, even, as the wise man said, feeding the very devil with God's own bread, until the Lord is largest misapplied, resent and drive us wholly from his side. For should the greyhound whom a sultan fed, and by a jewel of string a hunting led, turn by the way to gnaw some nasty thing, and snarl at him who twitched the silken string, would not his lord soon weary of dispute, and turn adrift the incorrigible brute? Nay, would one follow, and without a chain? The only master truly worth the pain, one must be where lest, growing over fond of even life's more consecrated bond. We clawed our footsteps to the world beyond, like that old Arab chieftain who confessed, his soul by two two darling things possessed, that only son of his, and that one colt, descended from the prophet's thunderbolt. And I might well bestow the last, he said, on him who brought me word the boy was dead. And if so vain the glittering fish we get, how doubly vain to dote upon the net, called life, that draws them, patching up this thin, tissue of breathing out and breathing in. And so by husbanding each wretched thread, Spin out death's very terror that we dread. For as the raindrop from the sphere of God, dropped for a while into the mortal clod, so little makes of its allotted time, back to its heaven itself to re-sublime, that it but serves to saturate its clay, with bitterness that will not pass away. One day the prophet on a river bank, dipping his lips into the channel, drank, a draught as sweet as honey. Then there came, one to an earthen pitcher from the same, drew up and drank, and after some short stay, under the shadow, rose and went his way, leaving his earthen bowl, in which anew. Thirsting, the prophet from the river drew and drank from, but the water that came up, sweet from the stream, drank bitter from the cup, at which the prophet in his still surprise, for answer turning up to heaven his eyes, the vessel's earthen lips with answer ran. The clay that I am made of once was man, who dying and resolved into the same, Obliterated earth from which he came was for the potter dug and chased in turn, through long vicissitude of bowl and urn. But howsoever molded, still the pain of that first mortal anguish would retain, and cast and recast for a thousand years would turn the sweetest water into tears. And after death, that, shirk it as we may, will come and with it bring its after day. For even as Yusuf, when his brotherhood came up from Egypt to buy corn and stood, before their brother in his lofty place, nor knew him for a veil before his face, struck on his mystic cup, which straightway then, wrung out their story to those guilty ten, not to them only, but to every one. Whatever he have said and thought and done, unburied with the body, shall fly up, and gather into heaven's inverted cup, which, stricken by God's finger, shall tell all the story whereby we must stand or fall. And though we walk this world as if behind, there were no judgment or the judge half blind. Beware, for you with whom we have to do. Out sees the lynx, outlives the phoenix too. So Sultan Mahmud, coming face to face, with mightier numbers of the swarthy race, vowed that if God to him the battle gave, God's dervish people all the spoil should have. And God the battle gave him, and the fruit of a great conquest coming to compute, a murmur through the Sultan's army stirred. Lest ill committed to one hasty word, the Shah should squander on an idle brood. What should be theirs who earned it with their blood, or go to fill the coffers of the state? So Mahmud's soul began to hesitate, till looking round in doubt from side to side, a raving zealot in the press he spied, and called and had him brought before his face, and telling, bid him arbitrate the case. Who, having listened, said, the thing is plain. 
If thou and God should never have again to deal together, rob him of his share. But if perchance you should, why then beware? So spake the Tajidar, but fear and doubt. Among the birds and whispers went about, great was their need, and succor to be sought, at any risk, at any ransom bought. But such a monarch, greater than Mahmud, the great himself, why how should he be wooed? To listen to them, they too have come. Oh, so suddenly and unprepared from home, with any gold or jewel or rich thing, to care with them this is so great a king. Poor creatures, with the old and carnal blind, spite of all said, so thick upon the mind, devising how they might ingratiate, access as to some earthly potentate. Let him that with this monarch would engage, bring the gold dust of a long pilgrimage, the ruby of a bleeding heart whose sighs, breathe more than amber incense as it dies. And while in naked beggary he stands, hope for the robe of honor from his hands, and as no gift this sovereign receives, save the mere soul and self of him who gives. So let that soul for other none reward. Look in the presence of its sovereign Lord, and as his hearers seem to estimate, their scale of glory from Mom of the Great, a simple story of the Sultan told. How best a subject with his Shah made bold. One night, Shah Mahmud, who had been of late, somewhat distempered with affairs of state, strolled through the streets disguised, as one to do, and coming to the baths there on the flue, saw the poor fellow who the furnace fed, sitting beside his water jug and bread. Mahmud stepped in, sat down, unasked, took up, and tasted of the untasted loaf and cup, saying within himself, grudge but a bit, and by the Lord your head shall pay for it. So having rested, warmed and satisfied, himself without a word on either side, at last the wayward sultan rose to go. And then at last his host broke silence, so, art satisfied? Well, brother, any day or night, remember when you come this way, and want a bit of provender, why, you are welcome, and if not, why, welcome too. The sultan was so tickled with the whim of this quaint entertainment and of him, who offered it that many a night again, Stoker and Shah were gathered in that vein, till the poor fellow, having stood the test, of true good fellowship, Mahmud confessed. One night the sultan that had been his guest, and in requital of the scanty goal, the poor man offered with so large a soul, bid him ask any largest that he would, a throne, if he would have it, so he should. The poor man kissed the dust, and all said he, I ask is what and where I am to be, if but the Shah from time to time will come, as now and see me in the lowly home. His presence makes a palace in my own, poor flew more royal than another's throne. So said the cheery tale, and, as they heard, again the heart beneath the feather stirred, again forgot the danger and the woes, of the long travel in its glorious close. Here truly all was poverty, despair, and miserable banishment, but there, that more than Mahmud for no more than prayer, who would restore them to their ancient place, and round their shoulders fling his robe of grace. They clapped their wings on fire to be assayed, and prove of what true metal they were made, although defaced and wanting the true ring, and superscription of their rightful king. The road, the road, in countless voices cried, the host, the road, and who shall be our guide? And they themselves, the Tajidar, replied, yet to make doubly certain that the voice of heaven, according with the people's choice, lots should be drawn, and he on whom should light, heaven's hand, they swore to follow him outright. This settled, and once more the hubbub quelled. Once more suspense the host in silence held, while, tribe by trot, the birds their fortune drew, and lo, upon the Tajidar it flew. Then rising up again in wide and high, Circumference of wings that mesh the sky, the Tajidar, the Tajidar, they cry, the Tajidar, the Tajidar, with him, was heaven, and they would follow life and limb. Then, once more fluttering to their places down, upon his head they set the royal crown. As caliph of their caliphs so long lost, and captain of his now repentant host, and setting him on high, and silence called, the Tajidar in pulpit throne installed, his voice into a trumpet tongue so clear as all the winged multitude should hear, raised to proclaim the order and array of march, which many as it frightened, yea, the heart of multitudes at outset broke, yet for due preparation must be spoke. A road indeed that never winged before, flew, nor foot trod, nor heart imagined, over, waterless deserts, waters where no shore, valleys comprising cloud-high mountains, these, again their valleys deeper than the seas, whose dust all adders, and whose vapor fire, 
where all one's hostile elements conspire, to set the soul against herself and tear courage to terror, hoping to despair and madness, terrors, trials to make stray or stop where death to wander or delay, where when half dead with famine, toil, and heat, to his death indeed to rest or drink or eat, a road still waxing in self-sacrifice as it went on, still ringing with the cries and groans of those who had not yet prevailed, and bleaching with the bones of those who failed, where almost all withstood, perhaps to earn, nothing, and earning, never to return. And first the L.E. of the S.E.R. Chesh, an endless maze, branching into innumerable ways, all courting entrance, but one right, and this, beset with pitfall, gulf, and precipice, where dust is embers, ere a fiery sleet, through which with blinded eyes and bleeding feet, the pilgrim stumbles, with hyenas howl around and hissing snake and deadly ghoul, whose prey he falls if tempted but to droop, or if to wander famished from the troop for fruit that falls to ashes in the hand, water that reached recedes into the sand. The only word is forward, guide in sight, after him, swerving neither left nor right, thyself for thine own victual by day, at night thine own self's caravanserai, till suddenly perhaps when most subdued, and desperate the heart shall be renewed, when deep in utter darkness, by one gleam of glory from the far remote harem, that with a scarcely conscious shock of change, shall light the pilgrim toward the mountain range of Nalalaji, where if stronger and more pure, the light and air yet harder to endure, and if perhaps the footing more secure, harder to keep up with a nimble guide, less from lost road than insufficient stride, yet tempted still by false shows from the track and by false voices called aside or back, which echo from the bosom, as if one, the journey's end when only just begun, and not a mountain peak with toil attained, but shows a top yet higher to be gained. Wherefore still forward, forward, love that fired, the first to search by search so re-inspired, as that the spirit shall the carnal load, burn up and double-wing thee on the road, that wert thou knocking at the very door of heaven, thou still wouldest cry for more, 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 till loom in sight calf's mountain peak ash rude, in mist, uncertain yet mountain or cloud, but where the pilgrim gins to hear the tide, of that one sea in which the seven subside, and not the seven seas only, but the seven, and self-enfolded spheres of earth and haven, yet the two worlds that now as pictures sleep, upon its surface, but when once the deep, from its long slumber gins to heave and sway, under the tempest shall be swept away, with all their phases and phenomena, not senseless matter only, but combined, with life in all varieties of kind. Yet even the abstract forms that space and time, men call, and wheel and woe, virtue and crime, and all the several creeds like those who fell, before them, musulman and infidel, shall from the face of being melt away, cancelled and swept as dreams before the day. So hast thou seen the astrologer prepare, his mystic table smooth of sand, and there, inscribe his mystic figures, square and trine, circle and pentagram, and heavenly sign of star and planet, from whose set and rise, meeting and difference, he prophesies. And having done it with his finger clean, obliterates as never they had been. Such as when reached the table land of one, and wonder, blazing with so fierce a sun, of unity that blinds while it reveals, the universe that to a point can deals, so stunned with utter revelation, reels. The pilgrim, when that double-seeming house, against whose beams he long had chafed his brows, crumbles and cracks before that sea who's near, and nearer voice now overwhelms his ear, till blinded, deafened, maddened, drunk with doubt, of all within himself is all without, nay, whether a without there be or not, or a within that doubts, and if then what? Even so shall the bewildered pilgrim seem, when nearest waking deepliest in dream, and darkest next to dawn, and lost what had, when all is found, and just when sane quite mad, as one that having found the key once more, returns and lo, he cannot find the door, he stumbles over, so the pilgrim stands, a moment on the threshold, with raised hands, calls to the eternal sake for one draught, of light from the one essence, which, when quaffed, he plunges headlong in, and all is well, with him who never more returns to tell, such being then the race and such the goal, judge if you must not body both in soul, with meditation, watch and fast prepare. For he that wastes his body to a hair shall seize the locks of truth, and he that prays, 
good angels in their ministry waylays. And the midnightly watcher in the folds of his own darkness God Almighty holds. He that would prosper here must from him strip the world and take the dervish gown and scrip. And as he goes must gather from all sides irrelevant ambitions, lusts and prides, glory and gold and sensual desire. Whereof to build the fundamental pyre of self-annihilation and cast in all old relations and regards of kin and country, and the pile with this perplexed world platform from the fables of the next, raise it toward culmination with the torn rags and integuments of creeds outworn, and top the giddy summit with the scroll of reason that in dingy smoke shall roll over the true self-sacrifice of soul. For such a prayer was his, O God, do thou, with all my wealth in the other world endow, my friends, and with my wealth in this my foes, till bankrupt in thy riches I repose. Then, all the pile completed of the pelf of either world, at last throw on thyself, and with a torch of self-negation fire, and ever as the flames rise high and higher, with cries of agonizing glory still, all of that self burn up that burn up will, leaving the phoenix that no fire can slay, to spring from its own ashes kindled, nay, itself an inextinguishable spark, of being, now beneath earth ashes dark, transcending these, at last itself transcends, and with the one eternal essence blends. The moths had long been exiled from the flame, they worship, so the solemn council came, and voted one of them by lot be sent, to find their idol. One was chosen, went, and after a long circuit in sheer gloom, seeing he thought the taper in a room, flew back at once to say so, but the chief of Mothiston slighted so slight belief, and sent another messenger who flew up to the house, at the window, through the flame itself, and back the message brings, with it no sign of conflict on his wings. Then went a third, and spurred with true desire, plunging at once into the sacred fire, folded his wings within, till he became one color and one substance with the flame. He only knew the flame who in it burned, and only he could tell who near to tell returned. After declaring what of this declared, must be that all who went should be prepared. From his high station, cease the Tajadar, and lo, the terrors that, when told afar, seemed but as shadows of a noonday sun, now that the talked of thing was to be done. Lengthening into those of closing day, strode into utter darkness and dismay. Like night on the hushed sea of feathers lay, late so elate, so terrible a track, endless, or ending, never to come back, never to country, family, or friend. In sooth no easy bow for birds to bend. Even while he spoke, how many wings and crests had slunk away to distant woods and nests, others again in preparation spent, what little strength they had and never went, and others, after preparation due, went up the veil of that first valley drew, from whose waste wilderness of darkness blew, a sarsar, whether edged of flames or snows, that threw from root to tip their feathers froze, up went a multitude that overhead, a moment darkened, then on all sides fled, dwindling the world-assembled caravan, to less than half the number that began. Of those who fled not, some in dread and doubt, sat without stirring, others who set out, with frothy force, or stupidly resigned, before a league, flew off or fell behind. And howsoever the more brave and strong, in courage, wing or wisdom pushed along, yet lead by lead the road was thicklier spread, by the fast-falling foliage of the dead, some spent with travel over wave and ground, scorched, frozen, dead for drought, or drinking drowned, famished or poisoned with the food when found, by weariness or hunger or affright, seduced to stop or stray become the bite, of tiger howling round or hissing snake, or crocodile that eyed them from the lake, or raving mad, or in despair self-slain, or slaying one another for a grain, till of the mighty host that fledged the dome, of heaven and floor of earth on leaving home, a handful reached and scrambled up the knees, of calf whose feet dip in the seven seas, and of the few that up his forest sides, of light and darkness, where the presence hides, but thirty, thirty desperate draggled things, half dead, with scarce a feather on their wings, stunned, blinded, deafened with the crash and craze, of rock and sea collapsing in a blaze, that struck the sun to center, fell upon, the threshold of the everlasting one, with but enough of life in each to cry, on that which all absorb, and suddenly forth flashed a winged harbinger of flame, and tongue of fire, and who, and whence they came, and why demanded, and the Tajadar, for all the thirty answered him, we are, 
those fractions of the sum of being far dispent and found this figure, that once more, strike for admission at the treasury door. To whom the angel answered, No, do not, that you seek Rex little, who or what, of quantity and kind, himself the fount, of being universal needs no count, of all the drops overflowing from his urn, in what degree they issue or return. Then cried the spokesman, Be it even so, let us but see the fount from which we flow, and seeing, lose ourselves therein, and lo, before the word was uttered, or the tongue of fire replied, or portal open flung, they were then, they were before the throne, before the majesty that sat thereon, but wrapped in so insufferable a blaze, of glory as beat down their baffled gaze, which, downward dropping, fell upon a scroll, that, lightning-like, flashed back on each the whole, past half-forgotten story of his soul, like that which Yusuf in his glory gave his brethren, as some writing he would have interpreted, and at a glance, behold, their own indenture for their brother sold. And so with these poor thirty, who abashed, in memory all laid bare and conscience lashed, by full confession and self-loathing flung, the rags of carnal self that round them clung, and their old selves self-knowledged and self-loathed, and in the soul's integrity reclothed, once more they ventured from the dust to raise, their eyes, up to the throne, into the blaze, and in the center of the glory there, beheld the figure of themselves as twir. Transfigured, looking to themselves, beheld the figure on the throne and miracled, until their eyes themselves and that between did hesitate which seer was, which seen. They that that they another get the same. Dividual, yet one, from whom there came, a voice of awful answer scarce discerned, from which to aspiration was returned, they scarcely knew, as when some man apart, answers aloud the question in his heart, the sun of my perfection is a glass, wherein from seeing into being pass, all who, reflecting as reflected see, themselves in me and me in them, not me, but all of me that a contracted eye, is comprehensive of infinity, nor yet themselves, no selves, but of the all, fractions from which they split and whether fall. As water lifted from the deep again, falls back in individual drops of rain, then melts into the universal main. All you have been and seen and done and thought, not you but I, have seen and been and wrought. I was the sin that from myself rebelled. I the remorse that tarred myself compelled. I was the Tajadar who led the track. I was the little briar that pulled you back. Sin and contrition, retribution owed, and cancel pilgrim, pilgrimage and road, was but myself toward myself and your. Arrival but myself at my own door, who in your fraction of myself behold, myself within the mirror myself hold, to see myself in, and each part of me, that sees himself, though drowned, shall ever see. Come you lost atoms to your center draw, and be the eternal mirror that you saw. Rays that have wandered into darkness wide, return, and back into your sun subside. This was the parliament of birds, and this, the story of the host who went amiss, and of the few that better upshot found, which being now recounted, lo, the ground of speech fails underfoot, but this to tell. The road is thine, follow and fare thee well. Chill Books Audiobooks with relaxing music, visuals and subtitles to help you stay engaged.